Okay, well, uh, everybody's uh, uh, still, we still have some people coming in, but let's get started. Uh, I know some, many of you have class at uh, 10 to 1. Um, I want to welcome you to um, the uh, 21st Millstone Lecture. Take a look at the program and you'll see the previous speakers. Um, my name is Roger Goldman, and uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of uh, St. Louis U Law School and our Dean, Mike Wolf. Uh, some of you um, are coming to the uh, talk for the first time, the Millstone Lecture. Let me give you a brief history of the lectureship series. Uh, it was family, friends, and colleagues of Jim who all felt that uh, a great and most fitting way to honor him was with an endowed lectureship that would include topics that were close to him, journalism, civil rights, civil liberties, and more generally issues of concern to individual citizens. Uh, to learn more about Jim, take a look at the program and you'll see a brief bio. And certainly tonight's topic fits in with his uh, 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 interests. I want to recognize now members of Jim's family who are with us tonight in the front row, his widow, Pat Millstone, and her longtime companion, Lyle Meyer, Jim's brother, um, David, and his wife, Devorah, who came in from Cleveland uh, for this occasion. After uh, our speaker's presentation, we will have a reception across the hall in the pavilion where you'll be able to meet uh, John Rapping. I want to say a little bit about uh, the history of Gideon and uh, Missouri. You're probably unaware, most of you are, that uh, Gideon's Promise is named after Clarence Earl Gideon, who grew up in, in Hannibal. Um, he was buried in an unmarked grave, uh, weren't quite sure where he was buried, uh, in his hometown of Hannibal, Missouri. Well, his grave was discovered by uh, a person of, uh, from St. Louis, uh, Joyce Armstrong, who's with us today. She was the founding director of the ACLU of Eastern Missouri. And it was literally because of her spade work that the grave was found. Talk to Joyce and you'll see what I mean. The ACLU then erected a gravestone uh, with this inscription uh, that Joyce thought of. It's taken from a letter uh, that Gideon wrote in 1962 to Abe Fortas, the future Supreme Court Justice. The court appointed him to represent him in the famous case of Gideon versus Wainwright. And this is what uh, is on the gravestone and what Gideon wrote. Each era finds an improvement in law for the benefit of mankind. Introducing our speaker is Steve Hanlon. He's a professor of practice at the law school. For 23 years, he served as partner in charge of the pro bono department at the Florida-based law firm Holland and Knight. In fact, Jim thought, uh, uh, Steve thought that uh, Gideon was in fact buried in Florida because that's where this took place. Um, during his tenure with Holland and Knight, uh, his pro bono practice was the largest in the country. Since his retirement, he has confined his practice to assisting and representing public defenders with excessive caseloads and is now the general counsel of the newly formed National Association for Public Defense in Washington, D.C. So Steve, would you come forward? Thank you, Roger. In his, uh, in his 1869 preface to Culture and Anarchy, Matthew Arnold recommends culture as the great help out of our present difficulties and argues that through culture, we can turn a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits, which we now follow staunchly but mechanically vainly imagining that there is a virtue in following them so staunchly, which makes up for the mischief of following them mechanically. I have watched John Rapping's prodigious efforts to redefine the culture of our half-century-old indigent defense system, working with a new generation of law students and public defenders to literally transform indigent defense representation especially in the South. His words are truly a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits, 
and he has convinced many young lawyers and law students to stop following those stock notions and habits immediately because of the mischief caused by following those stock notions and habits so mechanically. I asked Rapp to come here and talk at this great law school principally because of the remarkably courageous work that this law school has done in taking on virtually the entire legal establishment in this community and many of their stock motion, notions and habits in the year that followed the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. There were no stock notions and habits in that great effort by this law school. On the contrary, there was a great stream of fresh and free thought. So I fully expect Rapp's message will fall upon fertile ground here and that there will be many of you here today who will take that message and model your careers on the free and fresh thoughts that you are about to hear from this remarkable lawyer, teacher, thinker, leader, and most importantly, shaper of culture. So I ask you all to give a warm St. Louis welcome to John Rapping, this year's Millstone Lecturer. Good afternoon, everyone. What, what, a, what a pleasure to be here speaking uh, at a forum named after James Millstone. I had the opportunity to learn a little bit about who James Millstone was. I especially want to thank the family, especially his widow, Pat. Uh, if I take one thing away from what I learned about James Millstone, it's that uh, he was a storyteller, right? I think as journalists are. And what I really want to focus on today is talking about the story or narrative of justice that has come to define uh, criminal justice in America. And as Steve said, I work with public defenders and I want to talk a little bit about the role I see an army of public defenders playing in reframing that narrative of justice. And it's actually very appropriate to be having this conversation right here in St. Louis because I really think the narrative of justice uh, has been something on our minds for the past year uh, in the wake of the killing of Michael Brown. I think that what happened in Ferguson in August of 2014 really awakened people across the nation to the fact that equal justice in America is not a reality. That very highly publicized killing was followed by a number of highly publicized killings of other young black people. Eric Garner in New York, 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Walter Scott in North Charleston, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Samuel DuBose in Cincinnati, Sandra Bland down in Texas, and many others. And it really did awaken us to the fact that we have work to do. I work with public defenders every day, and what I like to say is that in addition to these really extreme instances of abuse, there's another thing we have to focus on, and that is routine injustice. Routine injustice that often flies under the radar. I frequently say that for every person killed by a police officer, tens of thousands are arrested, thrown into a criminal justice system, often given a very heroic public defender who is overwhelmed and overworked and under-resourced, sometimes beaten down. Those people are processed into prison cells. If they ever get out, they might lose their ability to return to their homes, to their families, to their jobs lose the right to vote, lose their ability to get educational loans. It's that routine injustice that is wreaking so much havoc on our most marginalized communities. And I really believe that the greatest anecdote to routine injustice in the court system is public defenders, the men and women who speak for 80% of those who are arrested and thrown into the system. So what I really want to talk about is the narrative that has evolved in this country and what public defenders can do to help reshape it. And so in doing that, I want to go back and think about the history of the story of justice in America, going back about 100 years to the part of the world where I now live and practice the South. And think about what was justice 100 years ago in the Deep South. Right? Frequently, it looks something like this. 
There was no justice. There was an accusation levied. A mob would find the nearest tree. There was an execution. There was no pretense of process, no pretense of justice. And that really was all the justice afforded our most vulnerable, commu vulnerable communities for decades following Reconstruction. And as a nation, we started to lose our appetite for such obvious injustice. And there was pressure put on Southern public defender systems. And the systems got the message. And they said to lynch mobs, you're making us look bad. If you would cut it out, if you would quit the lynchings, if you would just bring them to us, we will very quickly try them, convict them, and execute them. And we entered an era of legal lynchings, perhaps best epitomized by the Scottsboro boys. Nine children accused of raping two young white women on a train. They were pulled off the train, brought to trial 12 days later in Alabama. They were given two lawyers the morning of trial. One was a real estate lawyer from Tennessee with a well-known alcohol problem who just came down at the request of some family members to see what was going on. And the other was a 70-some-year-old lawyer from Alabama who hadn't tried a case in over 30 years. They didn't ask for a continuance. They didn't file any motions. They did no investigation. That afternoon, the trial started, and within days, eight of the nine Scottsboro boys were sentenced to die. One, the 12-year-old, given life without parole. And that case became a cause celeb, not only across the country, but across the world. People said, America is hypocritical that our rhetoric doesn't match our actions. And I like to think that it started a period where we started to support those who are willing to stand up for the underdog. In 1954, 1955, there was actually a TV show called The Public Defender. People would gather around their living rooms to watch a TV show about a public defender. The next year, this is true, there was a comic book called The Public Defender that hit the newsstands. Look at this guy, he's getting shot at. He's dodging a bullet, his hat is flying off his head, pipe coming out of his mouth, and kids are running to the newsstand saying, I don't care about Wonder Woman, I don't care about Batman, I wanna be the public defender. Our biggest stars played criminal defense lawyers on the silver screen, 1959, Jimmy Stewart played a man tasked with representing another man accused of murder, and we loved him, and we went to the theaters to cheer, and three years later, Atticus Finch hit the silver screen. Gregory Peck played a court-appointed lawyer in a small town in Alabama representing a black man accused of raping a white woman, and we loved it. It was justice embodied, and the heyday for public defenders went on. The following year, Gideon versus Wainwright happened. A man, a grifter, when it was accused of going into a pool hall and stealing some change and some bottles of beer and soda. He was in Florida where there wasn't a right to counsel, and so he was convicted without a lawyer. And he wrote a letter, a simple letter to the Supreme Court saying, this isn't fair, this is un-American. And the Supreme Court appointed one of the nation's most famous lawyers, Abe Fortas, to represent him. And out of that came the case, Gideon versus Wainwright, that said, we cannot have justice in our courts without lawyers. And the heyday continued. Perry Mason, the longest running TV show of the time about a defense lawyer. And not only did we root for the lawyers, we, wrote, we rooted for the outlaws. In the decade following Gideon, think of how outlaws were portrayed in the media. When I was a kid, my favorite movies, Cool Hand Luke, about a man imprisoned for cutting the heads off of parking meters, Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty as bank robbers and Bonnie and Clyde, Robert Redford and Paul Newman as train robbers and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Al Pacino and Dog Day Afternoon as a misunderstood bank robber. And we loved them. We loved these people who were deeply flawed but so human, and we rooted for them against the awesome power of the state. And then things changed. Then something happened. The nation started to see on television African Americans taken to the street demanding simple, basic justice. I was reminded of this not long ago. I was training public defenders in Baltimore the day the protests began in the wake of Freddie Gray's killing. And I remember seeing these demonstrators and seeing them as reasonable, peaceful, demonstrators, and then I returned to Atlanta where I live, and I turned on the news, and I saw a very different image. 
I saw protesters who were made out to look like outlaws, like threats to the moral fabric of society. And I, I thought about Southern politicians back during the 60s, men like George Wallace, who used protests over basic civil rights to galvanize white voters, to introduce a tough on crime narrative that took hold. In the 70s, Richard Nixon ushered in the war on drugs. But it wasn't a war on all drugs, it was a war on drugs primarily found in our most marginalized communities. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan ratcheted up the rhetoric as crack burst on the scene and we started to see a decade of mandatory minimums and harsh sentencing laws. And then in 1984, something completely changed the landscape for public defenders. You see, in 1963, when the court decided the Gideon case, they said every poor person has the right to a lawyer. They didn't say what kind of lawyer because I'm convinced the court didn't think it needed to. It was obvious. Gideon said that justice only happens through the lawyer in the court system, that our system of rules and laws are too complex for a lay person to maneuver alone. And if we believe in equal justice, implicit in that is that the kind of lawyer a poor person deserves is the kind you and I would pay for. So it didn't say it. Well, now in 1984, with a very different face, David Leroy Washington, the court was asked to answer the unanswered question, what kind of lawyer do poor people deserve? You see, unlike grandfatherly looking Clarence Earl Gideon, David Leroy Washington was a much more menacing looking, younger African American man. He had kidnapped and stabbed a gay priest to death. He broke into an apartment and tied up three elderly women, forcing two to watch him shoot the third in the head, killing her. And he kidnapped a third man, stabbing him to death. And with that as the defendant that was on everyone's mind during Strickland versus Washington, the court answered the question, what kind of lawyer do poor people deserve? Not much of one. Literally what the court did in Strickland was it created a new class of lawyer reserved only for poor people the incompetent yet constitutionally effective lawyer. Literally what the court said was if you think your lawyer is ineffective, you have the burden of showing two things. First, you must show that your lawyer was incompetent, that your lawyer was drunk during the trial, asleep during the trial, completely unprepared. But even if you do that, you've got to go a step further. And you have to show that if you had a competent lawyer, a sober lawyer, an awake lawyer, a prepared lawyer, you would have won. And that became a standard that was impossible to meet. And states got the message, maybe we need to give poor folks lawyers, but we don't need to give them much of one. And heroic public defenders began to see their caseloads go through the roof. Their resources stripped away, forced to fight with two hands tied behind their back. The tough on crime narrative permeated every aspect of politics up to the highest level. When the first George Bush, George H.W. Bush, ran against Michael Dukakis, who at the time was the governor of Massachusetts, he used that rhetoric to defeat his opponent. You see, Michael Dukakis was the governor of Massachusetts, and they had a furlough program. They released people on weekends before permanent re release them. It's a system that seems to make sense. But in this case, David, uh, I'm sorry, Willie Horton was one of the people released on furlough and rather than returning, he committed some terrible crimes. And Willie Horton became the poster child of Michael Dukakis', Dukakis campaign and he lost the campaign. And it wasn't just politics in the media. If, I don't know if anyone's seen the Ken Burns documentary about the set, Central Park Five, wonderful documentary. 1989, a young white woman jogging through Central Park when she was brutally beaten and raped. They very quickly identified five young teenage black boys and they were all but convicted in the media. The media literally ran headlines like wolf pack, coining phrases like wilding. You couldn't think of a more explicit effort to dehumanize these children. These young boys didn't have a chance and they were convicted. As we now know, they were wrongfully convicted. Those five young men were innocent, but they didn't have a chance in this tough on crime narrative that was taking hold. And this tough on crime narrative certainly wasn't partisan. Bill Clinton 
seen by many as the darling of the Democratic Party when he was running in the primaries in 1991. He was the governor of Arkansas. And there was a man on death row in Arkansas named Ricky Ray Rector. Ricky Ray Rector had killed a man, and when he went to turn himself into a police officer, he killed that police officer before putting the gun to his head, trying to take his own life. He didn't succeed in taking his own life, but he did blow away a portion of his brain, rendering him completely mentally limited. A very different person than the person who committed those terrible crimes. Ricky Ray Rector was convicted and sentenced to die, and his execution date came up while Bill Clinton was campaigning for president, and Bill Clinton had a tough choice to make. Do I commute? Ricky Ray Rector's sentence, or do I go home and preside over the execution? There was an article in the New Yorker where people who knew Bill Clinton described how he agonized over this decision because he knew it was wrong to execute a man who was so limited. But Bill Clinton wanted to be president, so we went home, and he presided over that execution. The night before Ricky Ray Rector was executed, he had his last meal and included, and that was a piece of pecan pie. And after he ate, he was too full for his pie, and he asked the guards to put his pie away for later. You see, he was so limited, he didn't realize there wouldn't be a later. But if you wanted to be president in this America, you could not commute a sentence of a man like Ricky Ray Rector. And so the image of the public defender ceased being Hollywood heroes like Jimmy Stewart and Gregory Peck and instead were portrayed like the bumbling, incompetent Alabama court-appointed lawyer in My Cousin Vinny. That became the new image of the public defender in Hollywood. On television, does anyone know the longest-running television show in our history? Law and Order. Do you remember the beginning to Law and Order? The, be the beginning to Law and Order. Let me play it for you. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. Bump, bump, right? In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecu prosecute the offenders. What's missing? Right? The criminal defense lawyer, the public defender is rendered irrelevant. Not even a speed bump on the road from arrest to conviction. And that is the new criminal justice narrative. That is what heroic public defenders stand up to every single day. Because as we stop seeing accused as people worthy of protections, as we stop seeing them as human, as we stop seeing them as Robert Redford and Faye Dunaway and instead of young super predators portrayed in movies like Menace to Society and Juice, we lose all respect for those who are responsible for ensuring that their rights are protected. This is one of my favorite paintings. It's by a man named Frank Wu, simply captioned Indifference. And the message is really quite straightforward. These robotic legs walking past a homeless veteran curled up in a fetal position. The message is simply that all of us every day are bombarded by so much sorrow and misery that it's a human defense mechanism to start to just become desensitized, to walk past it. I was reminded of this not long ago. I've got an 11-year-old daughter, and she's always been a homeless advocate. And when she was nine, I remember she'd wake up every morning and break open her piggy bank and put her change in a baggie. And she'd give it to the homeless man on the off-ramp as we drove to school. And one day I was walking down the street, and a man said to me, sir, can you spare a dollar? And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't help you. And as I took a couple steps, I felt a tug on my sleeve, and I looked down, and it was my daughter. And she said, Daddy, and I said, yes, baby. She said, Daddy, doesn't that man need a dollar more than you? <laughs> of course he did. And I thought to myself, where does she get those values? She gets them from me and from her mother, but all of us, we can lose sight of the very values we teach our own children if we don't guard against indifference. The consequences of our failure to guard against indifference in the criminal justice system can be severe. Take the case of Cameron Todd Willingham. 
Cameron Todd Willingham was accused of setting fire to his home in Corsicana, Texas and killing his three children. He was given a court-appointed lawyer and the primary evidence against him was uh, an expert who claimed that the fire was clearly intentionally set. And based largely on that evidence, Cameron Todd Willingham was convicted, sentenced to die, and ultimately executed. Well, after Cameron Todd Willingham was executed, some more reputable experts around the country started reviewing the evidence, and they came to a very different conclusion. They concluded that the fire was clearly an accident. It became clear that Texas had executed an innocent man. But there were t people who refused to accept that injustice occurred in Texas. Among them, who do you think was one of the greatest defenders of what happened to Cameron Todd Willingham? His own lawyer. His own lawyer. His own lawyer went on Anderson Cooper 360 and said this. There were no grounds for reversal and the verdict was absolutely the right one. Shoot. It's incredible anyone's even thinking about it. When asked about the other men and women he represents, this is what his lawyer had to say. Most of the time, they're guilty as sin. What chance do you have when you're poor, you don't get to choose your lawyer, and your lawyer comes in thinking most of the time they're guilty as sin? And this isn't a southern problem. Go north to Michigan and look at the case of Eddie Joe Lloyd. Eddie Joe Lloyd was accused of kidnapping, raping, and killing a young girl on her way to school. He was given a court-appointed lawyer who didn't do anything in his case, withdrew six days before trial. On the six days before trial, a new lawyer was appointed who didn't ask for a continuance, didn't do any work, didn't file any motions, and Eddie Joe Lloyd went to trial and was convicted. On appeal, Eddie Joe Lloyd was given another court-appointed lawyer who refused to visit him and wouldn't even accept his collect phone calls. You can imagine what happened on Eddie Joe Lloyd's appeal. It was denied. So in post-conviction, some lawyers alleged ineffectiveness down below, and among their claims was that the appellate lawyer was ineffective for not talking to his client. When asked about this claim, this is what Eddie Joe Lloyd's lawyer, his champion, had to say. This is a sick individual who raped, kidnapped, and strangled a young woman on her way to school. His claim of my wrongdoing is frivolous, just as is his existence. Both should be terminated. You know what happened to Eddie Joe Lloyd? He's one of the over 300 men and women who have been proven innocent through DNA, but he had no chance because in a system that has become indifferent to the plight of the poor, men like this can be appointed their guardians, their lawyers, their voices. And when we allow young lawyers, young heroic lawyers, and I work with them every day, when we allow them to get beaten down, many will leave, the few will resist, and many will become resigned to the status quo, and the results can be tragic because they can grow up to be leaders who have come to accept a system of injustice. And I was reminded of this when I was watching this budget hearing in Tennessee, and what I want to show you now is a testimony of a man who was elected by the other public defenders in Tennessee to speak for them. He's the president of the Public Defender Conference in Tennessee, and he was asked a very simple question. Do you have enough resources? And this is his response. I, I probably am blessed as, you know, there is, I guess, let me just say this. You know, y'all probably get up here and you always are asking for more and more. <laughs> But in, in my district, I think, I think, with assuming all this redistricting stuff, nothing happens, I think I have enough assistance to cover the caseload that I have. I have a five-county district. I have an attorney for each county. What I have done is converted one of my investigators into an attorney position so I could cover all the courts. And uh, then I have one investigator for my five-county district. In our case, though, we do about 4,000 cases a year. Uh, I have been blessed with retention of my staff, which means I have experienced attorneys, which really helps a lot in being able to process cases. Process cases. It's a time saver. Time in saver. Cases, uh, I think more efficient. More I think efficient. I 
I, I watch this video and I, I really do want to emphasize, I do not mean to be judgmental. I don't think this is a particularly bad public defender. I think what happened to him can happen to most of us. He is a product of 30 years of a system beating down on him and shaping him. And if we don't give support to public defenders, this happens. It happens to all of us. It is indifference. I don't believe this man came out of law school 30 years ago and said, you know what I want to do with my life? I want to process 800 people into jails a year. I don't think that's what he said. I think that he became a lawyer he never expected to be. This is one of a, a wonderful book I recommend called Ordinary Injustice, rec written by a lawyer and a journalist named Amy Bach. And she went around the country looking at criminal justice systems, and she saw that they, that they had accepted such a low standard of justice that injustice became ordinary, that we live in a, an America where ordinary injustice rules the day. She says that ordinary injustice occurs when a system of professionals lose sight of their very role in perpetuating unjust systems. The cost of ordinary injustice is enormous. We have 2.2 million people incarcerated in America, twice that number under some form of supervision at any given time. Men and women warehoused in small cells. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human. In Arizona, Sheriff Joe Arpaio elected popularly six times on a tough on crime platform. He warehouses pre-trial detainees, people presumed innocent, in tent cities in 120 degrees sweltering desert heat. He forces them to wear pink underwear. Now why would he do that? except because in his mind it's an attempt to strip them of every last shred of dignity that they have. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human. In California, thousands of inmates went on a hunger strike a couple of years ago. Some refused to eat for up to 60 days, literally saying, I'd rather be dead than housed in these conditions. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as less than human. I, I just had the honor of meeting with some of the folks from the, from the clinics here in this school and learned about what's happening in 81 municipal courts around St. Louis with fines and fees destroying people and families and communities. We couldn't do that to people if we saw them as human beings. So what I say to our lawyers is we have to rethink what it means to be a public defender. Not only are we tasked with standing up for one person at a time, one case at a time, although that's critically important, collectively we have the power to change assumptions about who poor people are and the treatment they deserve. Collectively we can be an engine to rewrite a criminal justice narrative that has lost its way. I think about Gideon versus Wainwright. And I think about the year that it was decided, 1963, same year as the March on Washington, same year as many civil rights milestones. And I think about that because Gideon can't be understood outside of the context of the time. It was decided during a time when we were struggling to live up to our ideals to provide basic civil rights to African Americans in this country, in all walks of life, in voting, in housing, in commerce, in education, and certainly among them was criminal justice. See, Gideon versus Wainwright is a civil rights case. The men and women who are public defenders are doing civil rights work. They are standing on the shoulders of all those civil rights warriors from 50 years ago. And there couldn't be a more important civil rights issue of this time than what's happening in our criminal justice system, seen broadly as a system that includes many civil consequences that are destroying communities. It is crippling our country. I work with young public defenders who are in some of the most challenging environments across the country, mostly in the Deep South, but some beyond. And we put them through a two-week program where we give them training and support 
community building. And they leave those two weeks feeling like they're going to change the world. And within a month, I start getting calls. And I get these calls every day. And the call is something like this. It says, Rap, I think I'm going to quit. I feel defeated. You know, I learned through Gideon's Promise what every client deserves. And I simply can't give it to them. I've got 300 clients. And I share with them the story from a book I read not long ago called Freedom Summer written by a man named Bruce Watson about that amazing summer project in 1964 where young people from around the country went to Mississippi to join heroic young civil rights workers, SNCC workers in Mississippi to register people to vote, to build freedom schools so pe people could pass literacy tests. And Bruce Watson tells the story of Freedom Summer through the eyes of the people who were there through interviews with them 40 years later. And through these interviews, you learned that these young people went to Mississippi thinking they could change the world. And their families told them you're crazy. Their families told them you're wasting your time. But they went anyway, undeterred. And they started knocking on doors, and one by one doors would be slammed in their faces as they were told that the church down the street was bombed, that they were afraid that they could be killed if they're seen talking. And as the summer went on through these interviews, you learned that these young folks, their enthusiasm turned to despair. They started to think, maybe my family was right, maybe I can't make a difference. And then Bruce Watson fast forwards 40 years to an interview with Congressman John Lewis, one of the architects of Freedom Summer. And John Lewis said, you know, if it weren't for Freedom Summer, Barack Obama wouldn't be in the White House. Quite literally, he was saying those young people changed the world. But change can be so incremental that sometimes those in the midst of it don't realize it's happening. And I share that with our lawyers and I say to them, every time you walk into a courtroom and a judge just wants you to process another person and you say, judge, I'm not doing it today. I refuse to do it today. At the end of the day, you might not get the tangible result that you know justice demands, that your client desperately wants. But when you do that, and your colleague does it in the courtroom next door, and another group does it in the next county over, and another group in the next state over, collectively you are raising expectations about what poor people deserve and what justice demands. Collectively, you're starting to change culture. I am convinced we will not have criminal justice reform if we don't address this problem of culture. I'm not saying it is the only thing we need to work on, but if we ignore it, we do it at the peril of realizing equal justice in America. I want to share with you some things we do with our young lawyers to try to help prepare them for this hard work. And in doing this, I want to, I want to show you three quotes. And I'm going to ask you all to pick a quote that resonates with you, the one that you like the most. And you might like them all, but I want you to pick one. All right, the first by Sister Helen Prejean. The dignity of the human spirit is that no person is as bad as the worst thing they've ever done. Next, Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Next, distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. Nietzsche. So how many of you picked Sister Helen Brejean? The dignity of the human spirit is that no person is as bad as the worst thing they've ever done. How many of you picked Margaret Mead, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And Nietzsche, distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. So I have a good friend in Kentucky, Jeff Shear, the training director in Kentucky, and he came up with this model that he calls the motivation triad. And he always he gives credit to folks like Abby Smith and Charles Ogletree uh, for helping him think through this. But this is the triad. He says that everyone who does this work for client-centered reasons, right? There are some folks that don't do this work for client-centered reasons. They do the work because they want to get trial experience or they couldn't get another job. They're, they're not in this model, right? This is a model for people that do this work for client-centered reasons. And Jeff would say, all of us have one primary motivator that drives us to do this work. We might have more than one motivator, but we have one primary motivator. Some of us are social workers. We do this work because we want to help people. We want to help people that have always been on the outside looking in. We want to help them get themselves back on their feet and get themselves back into the community. We're the social worker. Some of us were warriors. We just don't like bullies. 
Right? If you want to come after an individual with all the power of the state, I want to stand up for the individual. I'm the warrior. And some of us are movement builders. We say this system is racist, it's classist, it doesn't live up to our best democratic ideals, and I want to be part of a community of people who are working to change that so my children know a better world. I'm a movement builder. And Jeff would say that those of us who last the longest doing this work for client-centered reasons have figured out how to tap into all three of these motivators, because no one will get you through every challenge. You might be the social worker and you'll meet that client you just can't connect with. And maybe you need to tap into your warrior mode. And so we work with our lawyers on challenges they face to see them through these different lenses and to think about ways to motivate themselves to not become resigned to an unjust status quo. So for those of you who picked out Sister Helen Prejean, what do you think you might be? Maybe the social worker. For those of you who picked Margaret Mead, movement builder. Nietzsche, warrior. So that's something we do to work with our lawyers to think about how they can stay motivated to do this work in a system that quite frankly wants us to be demotivated, wants us to process. I also promised I would touch on ethics, because some of you need some ethics credit. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you a model we use to teach, teach ethics to our lawyers. And I want to confess that when I was in law school, I took professional responsibility. I knew I wanted to be a public defender, and I said, this course doesn't relate to me. We were talking about, you know, how you handle client funds. And I was thinking, this isn't a course for public defenders, because we didn't really talk about how it applies to the work that I knew I wanted to do. And for several years, I have to admit, I'm embarrassed now, I really didn't pick up the rules of professional responsibility. I now tell our lawyers, you need to sleep with those rules. And you need to know the comments. Because what I've learned is that every day we run into challenges that raise ethical dilemmas. And if you know these rules, you can resolve them in a, in a way that is both ethical and client-centered. And if you don't know the rules, you camp in a safe place somewhere right in the middle of this spectrum that isn't as client-centered as you could be. So this is the spectrum. The spectrum says every challenge we run into, there are almost an infinite number of ways to resolve those challenges. For some lawyers, their instinct is CYA. They're going to want to resolve that, in, that, that challenge in a way that protects them, protects their reputation, distance themselves from wrongdoing. I have news for you, law students. If you want to distance yourself from people who make mistakes, don't become a public defender. Matter of fact, you got to go find a mountain somewhere where no one exists because we all make mistakes. Public defenders agree to stand with those who do, but the CYA lawyer sort of wants to distance himself. Taken to the extreme, the CYA lawyer will land in ethical hot water. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a lawyer that wants to save the client at all costs. We love that instinct, but taken to the extreme, it also can land you in ethical hot water. So for example, we use a hypo where we have a client who's charged with a robbery and there's a very vague description, but there's a unique description of the shirt, a very unique looking shirt. And one day the client comes into the office with a bag. And he says, I got the shirt right here. What do you do? So what does a CYA lawyer do? They say, well, wait right there, sir. They go out and they call 911 police. <laughs> I've got something you want. That CYA instinct landed that lawyer in ethical hot water. What, is the, what does the save the client at all costs lawyer do? Not only before they burn it, they say, thank you, sir. You should leave. I don't want you to be involved in any of this. They burn it. <laughs> That instinct has landed that lawyer in some ethical hot water, probably some legal trouble too. So we work through all of the different ways you would handle and, and, and say, how can we get as far to the right as possible without crossing that line? But you can't know where those two lines are if you don't know the rules. So I'm gonna do one quick hypo with you and then I'm wrapping up. Here's an example we use. Assume you're appointed a new client, Mike client, who's charged with distribution of cocaine. As you prepare to handle the initial hearing, which will include a bond determination, you meet Mr. Client in the courthouse cell block. During the initial interview, you ask Mr. Client if he's ever been convicted of a crime before. He says he has two prior convictions for distribution of cocaine. When you receive the bail report that's given to the judge, she notes it's silent regarding any criminal activity. At the initial hearing, the judge is considering the amount of bond to set, 
The judge turns to you and asks, do you have any information about your client's prior criminal history counsel? And so we walk through different responses and think how we can get as far down that spectrum without crossing the line as possible. So here's one possibility. Yes, I do, Your Honor. Well, I've never verified this. It's my understanding he has two prior convictions for distribution of cocaine. Students here took professional responsibility. What's wrong with that? Confidentiality, rule 1.6. There's one line. The CYA lawyer could bump up against that line that is defined by rule 1.6 confidentiality. As much as you want to distance yourself, you've got to, you've got to obey 1.6. What about this one? Your Honor, this is Mr. Client's first time ever being arrested. My PR students, what rule does that violate? Candor to the tribunal, right? There's the other line. The save client at all costs line bumps up against, or the save client at all costs lawyer bumps up against that 3.3, that, that, that save client at all costs line. What about this one? I don't have to tell you anything. If you want to know, go find out yourself. <laughs> Is that ethical? It's ethical, probably not very wise, not very helpful to your client. What about this one? I don't have any information I'm able to provide the court to supplement the bail report. There's no criminal history reflected in the bail report, and I'd ask the court to rely on that for the purposes of this hearing. I will tell you that this then usually leads to a lot of discussion. Some people think this is perfect because you technically don't have any information you're able to provide the court. Why not? Because rule 1.6 prohibits it. Some people say, well, I would leave the first sentence off and just use the second. Some say I'd just use the first sentence and leave off the second. And we have this discussion and say it's not that there is one right answer. But if you don't do the exercise of thinking through many answers and getting as far down the client-centered end of the spectrum without crossing that line, the risk is you will camp in the middle and never be the lawyer your client deserves. So that's a taste of some things we do. In the interest of time, I am going to wrap up and just say this. The world is filled with hands that are reaching out, begging for help. And I believe there are three kinds of lawyers in this world. I believe the first kind of lawyer, they have positioned themselves to never see those hands. They live in gated communities. They drive to buildings and to, to, to law firms and high-rise buildings. They park underground. They literally never see people in desperation, and they've come to convince themselves they don't exist, or at least they have no responsibility for them. And sadly, I think that sometimes is the majority of lawyers. There's a second group of lawyers, and those lawyers have bought into a criminal justice narrative that say these hands are less than human. They join in on the piling on, the demonizing. And then there's a, small, a third group, a smaller group, a group that I know so many of your professors here are teaching you to become. And that's a group that says when I see a hand reaching out, a hand that needs help, a hand that doesn't have access to justice, I'm going to reach out and grab it. And I might not be able to save it, I might not be able to get it the outcome it wants, but at least that person will know that someone was there comforting them at their most difficult time. And if you can do that every day, that is success as a lawyer. So I'm going to end with one last video and then one last story. The video is actually, it comes from a, a, a commercial. I was watching a football game on TV once, and this commercial came on for feeding hungry children in Africa. And I watched it, and I thought, this is all about public defenders, except for the part about feeding hungry children in Africa. So I edited out the stuff about the kids in Africa. And I'm going to show you the clip, but before I do, I'm going to ask you a question. When is the last time you felt needed? For the public defenders in the room, I bet you don't have to think back more than 24 hours. For all the social justice lawyers in the room, for all of you who do poverty law, you don't need to think back more than 24 hours. We can forget, as hard as this work is, what a luxury it is to have an answer to that question. We can forget how many people don't have an answer to that question. This commercial reminds us of how, how many people can't answer that question.
time in my life when what? Oh, wow, that's a really hard question. When I was needed. Probably haven't, I haven't felt needed yet. So far, I've been needy. My sister, she needs me. I'm actually being needed right this second. Excuse me. <laughs> there was this kid in my class named Brady. When I thought about standing up for him, I didn't want to be in Paris, so I didn't. But I should have. Yeah. I didn't think, I just went. When, where, how? What do we need to do? It felt very exhilarating to sort of have that feeling of being a hero. I felt like I was necessary. So I fell to the ground with her and just laid right next to her. And uh, she'd go, why did you do that for? And I said, because uh, someone needs to be on the ground with you so I could help you up. So I want to end with a story. But before I do, I want to say this. I think for any of you who decide to work in unjust systems with the goal of making them a little more just, every day you are going to clash with a culture that is inconsistent with the lawyer you want to be. And every time that clash happens, one of two things will occur. Either you will, ever so slightly, start to change the assumptions of the people in that system, or that system will ever so slightly start to change who you are. I believe the first step in building a movement to change this criminal justice narrative is to build an army of advocates who, if nothing else, simply refuse to forget why they came to this work in the first place. And so with that, I'm going to end with my favorite story from the Talmud. It's a story about a wise old man. Oh, wait a second, Steve. I promised Steve one slide, and then I'm going to go to this. This slide, Steve likes. This is the public defender. Right? This is a public defender pushing the boulder up the hill, knowing they're doing heroic work, knowing the top is where we have to get to, but finding it so difficult to get there. And I want to share this quote I found about Sisyphus, because I think at the end of the day, this is what has to inspire those of us who spend our days pushing the boulder up the hill. In an absurd world, the struggle itself, the struggle toward the heights, not victory, is enough to fill, fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. There's nobility in doing that work. And so with that, I'm going to end with a story from the Talmud about a wise old man who went to Sodom, walking the streets, preaching against greed and indifference, preaching about righteousness and hopefulness. And at first, everyone listened. They were amazed. But over time, they started to tune him out. They'd laugh at him, talk behind his back. But the man was undeterred. He'd walk the streets day and night, preaching against killing, preaching about goodness. And one day a child came up to him and said, old man, you walk the streets day and night, yelling and screaming and preaching. And can't you see no one's listening? Can't you see no one cares? Can't you see it doesn't make a difference? And the old man said, I see that, son. And the child said, then why do you persist? And the old man said, let me tell you. If at first, when I came here, and I started preaching and screaming, it's because I thought I could change the world. I no longer think I can change the world. Today, if I continue to yell, if I continue to scream, if I continue to preach, it's no longer to change the world. It's to keep the world from changing me. If I have one message to you all, it is go out there, do what you know is right, and don't let this unjust world change you. If we all do that, we will be victorious. Thank you. It has been an honor to be here.